A couple of weeks ago, uh, I mentioned that uh, at this time of year is one of my favorites uh, because we are at kickoff. Um, we're getting into the first weeks of football season, last, this week, first week of college, next week, first week of pro. Um, it's a time that I always kind of count down to, preparing uh, just ongoing for fantasy football drafts and all that kind of wonderful stuff. But uh, this week, I was, uh, and, and, and a little confession to you, um, I may have mentioned this at the beginning, or a couple of weeks ago when I gave a homily about football season, um, particularly laughing at the Falcons for blowing a 28-3 lead. I want to make sure it stays in everybody's mind very, very uh, vividly. But uh, when we were, as, as during that homily, I remember I may have said something along the lines of, or I may have shared this story, but if I, if so, if I did, bear with me. Um, but when I first got assigned, one of the things, whenever the football schedule was announced, the NFL schedule, um, I made a point to go look at all the Sunday night games. Because in looking at all the Sunday night games that are going to be on NBC, I was like, okay, how many Saints games am I going to miss this year? So I'm rolling through and I'm looking and none, none, none. There's not a single Saints game on a Sunday night all year. And I remember sitting there feeling like I hit the absolute jackpot. That this was a great thing, awesome. I'm not going to have to miss a single game because of Mass on a Sunday night. This is great. And then I looked at the LSU schedule. <laughs> and the Lord loves to make a fool out of he who thinks he's wise. It was funny, leading up to this week, I have had probably four or five different people reach out to me asking me if I had plans on Sunday night. I have a feeling that at least one of those was for tickets. I have a feeling that at least two or three of those was for a barbecue or for a drink. And I may need one after Mass tonight. But it was funny because after I would say, no, I have Mass, then the response was, you're not getting anybody to cover? <laughs> and it's a perfect weekend to reflect on that question. Because if we look at today's Gospel, that's exactly what Jesus is attacking. This is one of the things that Jesus is going right at. Not going to watch a football game, right? But he's, he's looking at us, and He's making us reflect on today in the Gospel a question about priorities. Today is one of the hardest readings for us to listen to, I think, in all of the Scriptures. Today is one of the hardest moments, I think, whenever we hear, if anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I think when I, when I read it before, when we were proclaiming the Gospel, and just now, in both of, the, in both of those cases, you can almost feel the weight hit everybody's shoulders. What? What is Jesus actually asking for? That's a little bit too much. I don't know if I can do that. Well, first of all, when we look at today's Gospel, we have to realize the context and the time that Jesus is preaching and who He is preaching to. He's using a very, very popular way of preaching that rabbis used to use in the first century. And what those rabbis did is they may have said shocking hyper hyperbolic kind of language. They may have used these kind of tactics to drive a point home. Jesus is not putting, th putting love and hate against each other and saying you have to do everything that is not love of your family to follow me. In fact, that would cause a contradiction because Jesus, we know, is a big fan of the fourth commandment, which is honor your mother and father. So Jesus is not contradicting himself. But what he is saying is that if you love these things more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. It's a question of priority more than it's a question or a challenge to hate things that we should love. I'll use an example. Um, when I was a kid, I, I, 
I've said this before uh, in different contexts, but when I was a kid, I grew up right across the street from St. Mary's, and one of the things that we learned as kids at a very, very young age is when you pass in front of a Catholic church, you do the sign of the cross, right? We're going to recognize Jesus' presence in that church, in that tabernacle, that Jesus is here, he is present, that is his house, and if, instead of honking a horn or waving, we are going to make sure to make the sign of the cross every time we pass. My dad trained me in that. It was like militant. If we didn't do the sign of the cross, hey, yeah, sorry, sorry, you know. But I remember we're, we, we pulled out of the driveway one day, and we lived three houses away from St. Mary's, and when we pulled out, it was basically every single time we left the house, we made the sign of the cross. We get a couple of miles down the road, and out the corner of my eye, I might have been eight or nine years old, I saw my dad make another sign of the cross. And I was like, Where, did, did we pass another church? Did, did something else happen? What's going on? So I asked him, I said, Dad, what... Why did you just make another sign of the cross? And his response to me was, he said, well, when I pass in front of a church, I say a little prayer. Oh? He said, I usually say, I ask God to bless me. I ask God to bless your mama and you and Jackie. She needs it more than you. <laughs> he didn't say that. I worked that one in. Anyway. But I ask God to bless me, I ask God to bless our family, I ask God to bless my work, and I ask God to make sure that you win every baseball game you ever play. And it was funny and we laughed, but whether my dad realizes it or not, he gave me a very, very clear lesson, that that was the order of priority in life. That that was the order of priority, that it was God, then family, then work or school, then everything else. And that's what Jesus is asking us today, is to make sure that our priorities are in line with what it means to be a Christian. And that may, that, that may feel, we may feel the tension whenever we enter into that discernment, when we try and live more for God than we do for ourselves or even for our family and those whom we love. You see, today as we come to this mass, as we come to this mass, as we hear this gospel, as we as we ponder and, and wrestle with this question of what has the top priority in our life, I, I think it's a fair question to ask: what, what, What's going to make me happy? What is going to be the thing that is going to truly make me happy? And if that is a relationship with God, if we do believe that that is truly the thing, not just because we're sitting in Mass on Sunday morning, or not just because we went to Catholic school and it's the answer we're supposed to give, but if we truly believe that a relationship with God is going to be the source and summit, the true fulfillment of happiness in our life, then the next question is, are we willing to do the things to embrace it? Jesus continues in today's Gospel, which of you constructing a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Because when he's asking this question, he's saying how often do we actually think about and ponder and question and, and lay out what the cost of discipleship is going to be? Because there may be relationships that have to change. There, there may be choices in life, things that we get a lot of entertainment and fun from that might have to cease. What we spend our time doing may have to develop or be redirected. And those things sometimes can be hard. St. Thomas Aquinas once said, that if you want to be truly happy, if you want to fulfill the Beatitudes, right? if you want to be truly happy in life, then look at a crucifix. And love what Jesus loved on the crucifix and despise what Jesus despised. The counterfeit of happiness is being offered to us every single day repeatedly. And it usually takes one of four forms, or all of four forms, depending on where you are in your life. The world promises happiness through wealth. 
Just get more. But if we look at a crucifix, Jesus, that's the, the antithesis of wealth. He doesn't get a comfortable bed, He gets a cross. He doesn't have riches. Instead, His crown is made of thorns. If you want to be happy, the world says, then, then be powerful. Be a person with a lot of influence. Make the rules. Jesus is the sheep led to slaughter. Meek, humbly, with all the embarrassment in the world. Power wouldn't choose that. The world says if you want pleasure, then, then, be, then let it be of honor. Be a person of honor. Be a good person with a really good reputation that no one would ever say anything about bad. Jesus was falsely convicted, spat at, thrown down, and challenged to step off of the cross in His time of most agony. The world says you want to be really happy? Just be... Just be just embrace every pleasure. Be, be, like, embrace the hedonistic lifestyle. Food, sex, alcohol, whatever it is, the world, the creature pleasures of life, just embrace them and make them your own. Don't worry about anything else. That'll make you happy. Needless to say, the embarrassing death on a cross wasn't very pleasurable. If we want to be truly happy, if we want to live with our priorities according to that which Jesus establishes and Jesus challenges us today, then we are called to despise what Jesus despised on the cross and to love what Jesus loved. To be sacrificial for the sake of another. To be true and people of integrity so that we say what we believe and we believe what we say. And that's animated and, and inspired by the truth of the Holy Spirit. Today, as we come to this Mass, we come to humbly approach the Lord. Not for wealth, not for power, not for honor, not for pleasure. But because He's the top priority in our life. The final thing is that as we go, as we, if, if, we, if we see that this cost of following Jesus, this cost of discipleship, this cost of being a Christian that lives our faith loudly, proudly, and boldly is worth the cost. That it's a price I'm willing to pay. The, la the final thing is we need to realize that it's a process and not a moment. That we won't walk out of this church, most likely, God can work, and we pray that He does, but we won't walk out of this church all of a sudden with every one of our problems fixed, our priorities redirected and reordered perfectly, and everything's good through one Mass in one day. Or one homily that was a little bit too long. There's a, uh, I, I once heard a deacon use this image, and, and it's a beautiful image, and I wanted to share it in closing. Um, the process of smelting gold getting gold down to 24 carat, right? Pure gold. Um, is a process of taking chunks and bits of gold, putting them in a crucible and melting it down. Then when they melt down this gold, what happens is, is that all the imperfections in the gold will rise to the surface. Gold is a dense metal. It will fall to the bottom. Other imperfections will rise to the top. And what happens is, is that the smelter, the person who's doing this process, when they have this gold, they will take a, the equivalent of a spoon and they'll skim all the imperfections off the top of the molten gold. As they do this, they know when they are done, when they can see their own image reflecting back at them. The process is a hot process. It's one that for the gold hurts. Purifying does, it does not feel good all the time. But as we are purified, 
the one who is doing the purifying gets to see his face develop more and more and more when he looks at us. That he can see his reflection in who we are. As a Christian, that's the epitome of what we're called to be. A reflection of God. So today, as we come to this Mass, may we humbly receive Him and may God, we we pray, may God make it possible that when we walk out of this church, that people, when they see us, see Jesus working through us. That when people see us, that our own personality, in a lot of ways, can be purified. And through the gifts that God has given us, they can see us, they can come to know Jesus better through us. But that can, only take, that, that can only take hold if we're willing to reorder our priorities and to enter into some purification. May today, as we come to this Mass, and as we depart, we be willing to enter into that process.